it is my sincere pleasure to convey best wishes to your guests. I've seen firsthand your exemplary contributions to addressing poverty, hunger, and inequality. I am inspired by your care for the most vulnerable and your commitment to peace, solidarity, and social justice. As the theme of your assembly rightly states, we are indeed one human family. Yet we see millions of people in need of safety and assistance. We see a rise in xenophobia, intolerance, persecution, and incitement for violence. This is why the United Nations is mobilizing against hate speech and in support of efforts to protect religious sites. We must also build a fair globalization that delivers for all. And we need ambitious and urgent action to protect our common home. The impacts of climate change are upon us, driving displacement and humanitarian need. I'm convening a climate action summit in September and I count on your support. Change is possible. I echo the call of His Holiness Pope Francis for us to pursue a new and more sustainable path. Only together can we build a future of dignity, peace and prosperity for all on a healthy planet. Thank you. Voilà, vous avez entendu le message de Monsieur Antonio Gutiérrez, secrétaire général des Nations Unies, qui a entre autres parlé du sommet sur le climat. Je vous le disais, donc, cette deuxième partie se composera de deux sessions de la durée d'une heure chacune, la première sur le monde, la deuxième sur l'Église. Chaque session va suivre un même schéma, chacune s'ouvrira par deux interventions suivies d'une demi-heure environ d'échange. Vous pourrez réagir, vous exprimer, poser vos questions, proposer des solutions aussi, pourquoi pas, en un mot dialogué comme les membres d'une même famille. Le but est de faire le point, de confronter des idées afin d'orienter les réflexions de cette assemblée. L'encyclique du pape François le date aussi, publié il y a tout juste quatre ans. Ce texte tire la sonnette d'alarme face aux injustices climatiques. À l'ouverture de cette première session, nous aurons deux regards différents, deux perspectives différentes. D'un côté, celui du directeur d'une importante agence de l'ONU, José Gratiano da Silva, que je vous propose d'applaudir tout de suite, Monsieur Da Silva. Et de l'autre, de l'autre, celui d'une humanitaire, une femme, Babita Alik, qui a une longue expérience dans la gestion des projets de développement et des interventions d'urgence au niveau local. Et, et son niveau Notre premier intervenant est donc le directeur général de la... Je ne vais pas... Euh, euh, tant que nous sommes nombreux, il faut être concis, à commencer par moi. Euh, mais Monsieur Da Silva, vous êtes donc directeur général de la FAO depuis 2012, euh, vous êtes déjà à votre deuxième mandat, et vous avez une longue expérience dans le domaine de l'alimentation, la, de l'agriculture, la, de donc des domaines qui sont aujourd'hui les vôtres, puisque vous avez été, euh, vous avez participé, vous avez été à l'origine d'un projet très important dans votre pays, le Brésil, donc, vous étiez bien connu déjà avant de devenir directeur général de la FAO. Donc, je vous invite à prendre la parole. Merci. I would like, first of all, to thank Cardinal Tagli, mon cher ami Michel Roy, pour l'invitation. Uh, as you may know, FAO is Food and Agriculture Organization. We are the branch of the UN systems that takes care of uh, agriculture, forestry, fisheries, soil, land and water, and so on. So a broad mandate. And uh, uh, we are very happy to join this meeting here today and uh, to be partners of the work of uh, Caritas around the world. My previous experience in Brazil, Caritas was fundamental to address the issues in the Northeast area, remote areas, uh, and uh, I reflect so well the motto of the 23rd agenda, not, not to leave anyone behind. Caritas is one of those institutions, and we in FAO, we would like to join our efforts, especially in the next four years, where you have this motto, one human family, one common home, 
that's our own concern also. Uh, I have a big concern nowadays about many people, but especially some governance that are, let's say, thinking that they can do better alone, uh, uh, not uh, believing anymore on multilateral agreements, trying to go for their own. We should remind those people we are in the same boat. Uh, there's no plan B because there's no planet B, at least for the moment, for the future perhaps, but not now. So we need to get together. And uh, I think that one of the most important, perhaps for me, I would say the most important voice that we have now in the international arena reminding us about this, how that to see teach us about the importance of uh, the relation between human beings and nature. That's exactly what FAO tries to manage. Let me repeat, our planet, our Rome, we cannot continue to do business as usual. So it's fundamental for us to find ways to increase function, but not all food. We need to look for healthy food, nutritious food, healthy food for all is how to develop. That is what FAO tries to pursue. Just uh, four years ago, in September 2015, the United Nations members get approved are the one and two. And not by sort that they are the of the agenda. We firmly believe if you don't achieve the SDG number one and two, eradicate poverty and hunger, it will be impossible to achieve all the others. So I will try to concentrate my uh, talk today on what is affecting poverty and hunger uh, global. Uh, globally. And I will start with saying that you will see that not by coincidence, since we approved the 23rd agenda in 2015, the poverty numbers and the hunger numbers that were coming down for 20 years started to revert and go up. Since 2015, we have an increased number of hungered people in the world. Nowadays, about 820 million people. And uh, the numbers that we will FAO ever estimates will show another increase in this total. Uh, and uh, uh, there are three basic reasons for increase of hunger and poverty in the last three, four years. Uh, I would say that the primary cause since 2015, we have emerged in many conflicts. Yemen, to start with the worst case. Uh, and the conflict is disruptive for economic human life. So uh, it's not by sort that we have nowadays two out of three people that are hunger in the world lives in a country under conflict. So very targeted. The second cause of uh, increased number of hunger and poverty, impacts of climate change, particularly prolonged drought and floods in Africa. This is affecting food production in Africa. There is where we have the most complicated problem to feed the population. Nowadays, we produce more than enough to feed all people around the world. Even worse than that, we throw out one third of all the food we produce. We waste it or we lost it. But in Africa, we have a problem of food production. And when we have prolonged draw or floods like we have in nowadays in Mozambique, in uh, Zimbabwe, etc., uh, hunger goes up. 
So conflict, hunger, uh, 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 conflict and uh, impact of climate change. And when the things get together, when there's the overlapping of conflict and impact of climate change, as it happens in the Sahel, you know the Sahel? Goes across Africa, from Ethiopia on one side to Senegal on the other, or Cap Verde if you stand the line. Uh, there is where conflict and impact of climate change make the things even worse. Those are the two. But additional to those two, we have an emerging issue. Again, uh, we still, so since uh, 2011, 12, uh, we have seen economic slowdown in growing in all parts of the world, but particularly in countries called mid-income countries, like uh, Latin American countries, for example. And this slowdown of growing in developing countries means growing unemployment. If we cannot grow economically, we cannot provide opportunity for jobs for especially young people. We cannot provide opportunities for farmers to produce more. So also hunger goes up. Those are the three main problems that we have mentioned three main indicating fault. First, build resilience, particularly in rural communities, because most of those affected by impact of climate change live in rural areas or in small villages. So build resilience is very important. Build resilience, for example, is what saw someone from the ASA, Association of uh, the, that uh, is building cisternas in nor northeast of Brazil is a good example of building resilience. We collect water and storage. Uh, there are many other actions that we can mention. Important that build resilience means that for saving lives, we need to save their livelihoods. To save the the, their home. That's a very important notion. We cannot save, think about a, a, a pastor in the Sahel. If he loses their herbs, the goats and sheep, what he will be? So this is the point. It's not enough to save lives, bringing food, food aid. We need to save the environment, the livelihood, where they live, their house, their farm, their pastures. Second, uh, we need to provide means for family farmers to adapt to impact of climate change. There are many things that we can do for them to resist to a drought. We cannot avoid to have a drought, but we can avoid a drought to turn to famine or to migration, or to desperate people. So there's a lot of things that we can do on that, but this costs money and we need uh, to invest on this area, especially the family farmers that need our priority help. Third, to face the economic slowdown, social programs, social safety nets, public social pro policies. I'll give a, one a good example that we have, again, thinking of using that, many other countries nowadays, but a special program that we take care of very careful is providing school meal programs for children in the school. But it's not school meal programs with food that we bring from donations abroad and uh, uh, bring to the community. S school meal programs with products local produced that could be bought by the community, by the family, the farmers that are around the school. And this is a very promising model that FAU is working with World Food Program 
and implementing many areas, including Africa and Asia. We started in Latin America, but now we have reached Africa. And I just visited Laos a week ago, and we have there uh, 2,000 schools applying this model in Laos. Ladies and gentlemen, let me uh, put a focus now on the SDG number two, that is eradicate hunger and how forms the malnutrition and promotes uh, uh, sustainable agriculture development. Uh, our main problem nowadays, unfortunately, is not only hunger. As I said, hunger, we know where the hungry people are. In conflict areas, suffering impact of climate change, in the private economic zones. But this, there is another epidemic going on that's everywhere. Uh, this uh, number now has reached about uh, near uh, 670 million people are considered obese according to our last figures last year. And this number is increasing steadily. Overweight affects 2 million people around the world. 2 million people. Could you imagine that? And there are some areas where obesity, especially among uh, women, can go up to 6 70%, like more and more what is called ultra-processed food. What ultra-processed food? You go to a supermarket, you find most of it. Sausage, all kinds. Uh, chips of all kinds. Even don't know what they use to produce it. But you can taste that it is heavy in sugar, refined sugar, heavy in salt, saturated fats, and chemical additives. This is what is called ultra-processed food. Uh, importing ultra-processed foods is considered nowadays the main one that we can see is that soon obesity will be, the numbers of obese people will be bigger than the hunger people. It is always bigger in Latin America. We have in Latin America three times more obese people than hunger people. And worse, it's affecting mainly women and children. And this is uh, what we can say clearly that will compromise future generations. Obesity now is the third higher expenditure uh, in healthcare around the world. First one is like hurt, uh, diabetes, and many others related to obesity. So we lost every year now about $2 trillion, according to the last estimates made by World Health Organization. And near, uh, as I said, 2, million, 2 billion people around the world are being affected by overweight and uh, near uh, 700 are considered obese. Uh, what to do? Of course, try to find ways to reduce the consumption of uh, ultra-processed food and basically alert consumers about that. Because most of the time we don't know what we are eating. Uh, my grandmother used to cook and she goes to the pick up the products, vegetables, fruits, etc. So we knew what was in the soup. But now when you buy soup in the supermarket, you have no idea what's inside. And if you try to read it, you can't do it. Or if you do it, there is no, uh, let's say, meaning things that you can really know what you're going to eat. So make the labeling of those products is one of the most important battle that we have nowadays. Provide the consumer the right information 
what he is going to eat. And our responsibility is not the problem of the mother that the, the child is obese. This is a public issue, the health issue for the whole society. So we need to have our governments uh, working uh, on that. Uh, we are in FAO trying to promote this idea to have a convention that deals with healthy food. Nowadays, the only rule that we have for trade is for the, the food to be safety, what means that it is not uh, poison uh, or uh, not uh, deteriorated. But that's not enough because not all food that is safety, our right to food, to say right to a healthy food for all. And that's what we are trying to do. Let me move now for the sustainability. Uh, as you may know, uh, we had in the last century, in the 50s and 60s, what is called the Green Revolution. The Green Revolution is uh, uh, some techniques that improved a lot productivity, especially of commodities, and thanks to the, uh, the Green Revolution, we avoid a big famine, famine in the 70s and 80s of last century, particularly in India, China, uh, and uh, uh, Asian countries. But now, the way that we are producing food, as I said, we have already enough food for all, but we try always to increase food production at all costs. We are having a lot of impact in the environment. Main impact is deforestation, that we are using a lot of chemicals, uh, especially pesticides, and antibiotics also in animals and plants, more and more use of antibiotics. Uh, and uh, this is something that cannot go on that way. We need to find another way to produce increased food production. And we have alternatives nowadays, fortunately. One alternative that FAO is promoting is what we call smart climate agriculture. Also, we are promoting agroecology that you may know. So there are many use of chemicals and pesticides, particularly. Let me uh, go to the last point that I would like to raise. Our main concern in all of this is to preserve the family farmers. Family farmers are responsible for most of the food we eat. More than that, family farmers are the ones that can produce locally. In small village communities, they are there. They can provide fresh food. They can provide fruits, vegetables, eggs, chicken, and so on. Uh, so we need to try to preserve uh, with climate change because this needs a lot of investments. And most of them are public investments. Just to start, we need much more local research and extension service to help those to adopt those new techniques. We need also new irrigation systems, not to use the traditional irrigation system that uh, uh, needs a lot of water. We need uh, now this good to good or drop by drop, that we can do a hundred times what we do with the traditional system. So it's about uh, the farmers, small farmers, family farmers need. We will have next week in FAO, we will launch the decade of family farm with IFAD, uh, that's our sister agents uh, in Rome. And uh, I would like to invite all of you, of you, if you could, to be present in our meeting in our headquarters. Thank you very much for this opportunity.
de la FAO, l'Organisation des Nations Unies pour l'alimentation et l'agriculture. Merci de nous avoir alertés sur les aliments ultra transformés et sur la menace que représente l'obésité. Nous avons entendu que les chiffres de l'obésité vont devenir, vont l'emporter sur ceux de la malnutrition. Donc, c'est vraiment un appel important. Notre deuxième intervenante est issue des rangs de la grande famille des Caritas et de Caritas Inde, je vous le disais tout à l'heure. Babita Alik travaille depuis 2000 ans, donc depuis 18 ans à Caritas Inde. Elle a commencé en qualité de chargée de communication, mais elle a occupé ensuite plusieurs postes. Elle a beaucoup travaillé dans le domaine du développement en s'efforçant d'appliquer les principes de la doctrine sociale de l'Église. Elle est actuellement dirant Babita Ali, je vous invite à prendre la parole. Vous avez une dizaine de minutes environ. Merci. Eminence Cardinal Tagle, my dear friends on the dais and all the friends in the house, Namaste. Good morning to you all. With gratitude, I stand here, thankful for the opportunity to share the harsh realities on the local grounds and how privileged are we to be in a position to be the change. Amidst the comfortable life that we all dwell, we have lost sight of the unremitting toil that a vast majority has faced throughout human history. There are many still for on a level at or below endurance. Though a lot of efforts have been drawn towards addressing the sustainable development goals, we must also be conscious that our efforts have been fragmented. Persistent poverty still ravages the lives of one in four people in the developing world. Women and girls remain vulnerable. The environmental thread is being troubled, causing huge loss to our biodiversity and our planet's natural resource. The impact of climate change threatens to be getting evident. While it may have dwindled in some parts, food and nutrition security continues to remain alarmingly challenging. These continue to remain our overarching challenges. Six of the 10 largest nations in the world are in the Asia Pacific. The region may be adding value to the global economy and working strenuously towards advancing human development. Yet, despite these, there are still some burning challenges that are cringing the path of sustenance. Hailing from the incredible India, the land of diversity, I can proudly share that our culture is one of the oldest known to humanity. And yet, we as a nation are still struggling post-independence, trying to meet the challenges of a staggering population of 1.3 billion. India is ranked 131st on the Human Development Index 2016. Karitas in India as a humanitarian organization has been journeying with the poor for more than five decades. In her pursuit to be relations of the poor, Karitas at the ground together with her local grassroots collaborators has been grappling with different development issues. Some of the most crucial ones are rising vulnerability to climate change and disasters. The impact of climate change in the rural and urban areas has been gradual yet steady. Rural livelihoods are declining and disaster induced risks are high. This has also led to internal displacement and migration. More frequent and extreme droughts have deeply impacted the vulnerable li livelihoods. Once a century rains that have pounded Kerala in the south of India in 2018 and displaced 5.4 million people are in line with the predictions of climate scientists who warn that worse is to come if global warming continues unabated. 
the monsoon rains upon which farmers in Kerala depend for their food and livelihoods dumped two and a half times the normal amount of water across the state, according to metrologists. As efforts continue to help people sheltering in the thousands of relief camps across the state, this was a wake-up call that more needed to be done to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Agrarian crisis and food insecurity. Farming is fast becoming a non-viable activity. Land degradation in the form of depletion of soil fertility, erosion, and water logging has increased. There has been a decline in the surface irrigation expansion rate and a fall in the level of the groundwater table. Long-term factors like steeper decline in per capita land availability and the shrinking of farm size are also responsible for the agrarian crisis. High input costs, credits, climatic challenges, low productivity, lack of storage, low prices for the produce have led to distress among farmers and between 2014 and 2015. Conflicts and social polarization. During the past few years, religious tolerance has deteriorated and religious freedom violations have increased and there is growing social polarization. India faces serious challenges to both its pluralistic traditions and its religious minorities. Communal violence witnessed a 17% rise in the reincidence as low intensity violence and caste-based polarization along the communal lines is increasing. The emerging hub of modern slavery. More than 10 million children are employed in some form of labor. Of the 167 countries surveyed under Global Slavery Index 2016, India has the highest number of people living in slavery, more than 18 million people. That's almost 1.4% of the population and is ranked fourth country in terms of prevalence of slavery. As many as 4.2 million people, including men, women, and children, work as domestic servitudes and are prone to overtime working hours, withholding of wages, insufficient remuneration, and sometimes even physical and sexual violence. There is no distinction drawn under the existing trafficking legislation between human trafficking and sex work, which makes interpretation of results difficult. Gender inequality in India persists despite high rates of economic growth and is particularly indebutable among marginalized groups. The constitutionally guaranteed equality for women is juxtaposed with the harsh societal reality. Women in India complete half as many years of schooling on average as men and have less than half the share of men in the gross national income. The thirst of water for India's rapid development is growing day by day. Despite adequate average rainfall in India, there are large areas under less water conditions and drought prone. Health is a bigger casualty in the current context. India continues to be one of the poor performers ranking at 154th in terms of quality and accessibility of healthcare. India faces the double burden of infectious diseases and a dramatic rise in non-communicable diseases now estimated to account for more than half of all deaths. Rapid urbanization, almost 27% Indians live in urban areas. Urbanization and industrialization have given birth to environmental stress. Our pursuit. The church has recognized for many centuries the call to care for people on the margins of society as key to living out our mission as followers of Christ. 
The globalization of indifference shared by our Pope Francis constitutes a serious threat to the human family. These development issues are a prolonged situation of injustice, social imbalance, resignation, and indifference. Caritas India, taking inspiration from the Catholic social teachings and founded on the mission and principle of diaconia, has pledged not to just serve the weak, but serving and living in communion with each other through our strategic directives of empowerment animation, dialogue with and for the poor, dialogue with nature, selfless volunteering, and sharing communities. One of our programs, Asha Kiranam, a campaign against cancer, which was an initiative of our executive director, Father Paul, and under the mentorship of our chairman, Bishop Lumen, is a dividend that the church has received in the form of large community participation with a beautiful display of the ownership of the processes by the communities, convergence of actions by different stakeholders, collectivization of efforts in mobilizing resources, human capital being organized to create a movement against this pandemic and the willingness to share this is an exemplary demonstration of dealing with indifferences to address the cause. Differing and conflicting needs, wants and goals set in There is a need for the communities to be at the forefront and development needs to be inclusive. If people at the ground have a clear perception of what constitutes development, their participation shall yield manifold. The need to ascertain the level of people that shall be holistic and fulfilling only if the people whom we serve participate together to address the conditions of deprivation and secure themselves a secured haven. Thank you. Babita Ali, que nous avons entendu José Graziano da Silva nous donner une vision générale donc de la situation. Il nous a entre autres dit que la pauvreté et la faim avaient augmenté ces trois dernières années. Et Babita nous a donné une description par moment alarmante de la situation locale, donc dans ce... qui est entre autres un mauvais élève en ce qui concerne les soins de santé. Donc c'est maintenant à vous la parole, place au débat. Après ces deux interventions, vous allez pouvoir réagir, poser vos questions, exposer votre point de vue. Des micros ont été répartis dans la salle, il y en a quatre. J'invite ceux qui souhaitent s'exprimer à se lever et à se diriger vers les micros. Vous avez des assistants qui sont prêts à vous aider. Je vais vous demander, enfin, je donnerai la parole en donnant le numéro du micro. Je vous demanderai de dire votre nom, votre pays d'origine et votre fonction. Et surtout, je vous demande, s'il vous plaît, d'être concis. Nous sommes très en retard. Vous êtes nombreux de participation. Donc, voilà, si vous souhaitez prendre la parole, je vous invite à vous diriger vers les micros. Il y a un micro 1. Euh, vous pouvez soit réagir par rapport à ce que vous venez d'entendre, donc aussi bien l'intervention euh, du directeur général de la FAO, donc, qui nous a euh, alerté sur les problèmes qui, euh, qui concerne le monde entier, ou bien sur des questions évoquées par Babita à l'instant. Je crois qu'il y a quelqu'un au micro 1. Euh, je vous en prie, allez-y. 4, c'est le 4 euh, Ah, parce que non, il y a un, un numéro 1. Oui, oui. Est-ce que je peux parler en arabe, en italien En italien. Pour, expré, euh, pour exprimer bien le secrétaire général me dit oui que vous pouvez vous exprimer tout, en italien. Prima di tutto, io ringrazio i nostri amici che hanno parlato molto, però avrei voglia che parlassero contro la guerra, per la pace, perché il mondo ha bisogno della pace. C'è molta fame perché c'è la guerra prima di tutto 
la guerra non solo contro con i, le cose, cioè contro per vendere le armi, non soltanto con le armi, ma c'è anche una guerra grande morale nel mondo. C'è un'altra guerra contro i bambini, un'altra guerra contro per avere gli interessi. Tutto questo per, tra parentesi, come possiamo seminare l'amore nel mondo contro la guerra. Grazie. Merci beaucoup. Alors, je précise Sono que vous êtes... Monsignor Salomon Warduni dell'Iraq. Je, je vous remercie, Monseigneur. Voilà, justement, j'allais dire que vous êtes de Caritas Irak et que vous êtes, pour ceux qui ne connaissent pas l'italien, mais je pense que vous aviez une traduction euh, déjà. Voilà, très bien. Donc, c'était un appel pour qu'on parle de, de nous dire euh, qui vous représentez. Je m'appelle Diabo Boniface de la Caritas Congo, Congo RDC. Et je voudrais m'adresser euh, au premier intervenant, le directeur général de, de la FAO. Alors, euh, mon intervention, c'est au sujet de forêt. J'ai beaucoup aimé l'intervention du directeur général de, de la FAO. Et comme vous le savez, depuis plusieurs siècles, les forêts constituent euh, une source de, de, de revenus, de survie pour les, les populations rurales. Euh, les populations qui, qui vivent autour de forêts. Et parce qu'il y a un problème de climat, les Nations unies demandent qu'on euh, qu protège les forêts, qu'on préserve les forêts. Ce qui fait qu'aujourd'hui, il y a beaucoup de populations qui ne peuvent plus utiliser les forêts, d'où elles tiraient leurs ressources pour la survie. Et en revanche, il a été demandé que les Nations unies donne de fonds au gouvernement qui euh, laisse leur forêt pour protéger, n'est-ce pas, la terre. Mais jusqu'aujourd'hui, surtout en Afrique, ces fonds n'arrivent pas. Qu'en est-il au juste Merci. Merci beaucoup. Donc, les forêts, on a bien compris une situation euh, euh, qui caractérise en particulier cette région du monde. Donc, nous voyons qu'il y a déjà des réactions euh, sur des sujets locaux, donc l'Irak préoccupé par les, les conflits, et, et puis la, le Congo, les forêts. Nous avons quelqu'un au micro 3, je vous en prie. Je m'appelle Monseigneur Joseph Kerber, je suis président de Caritas Gabon, et j'ai une étiquette supplémentaire, je suis naturopathe. Alors j'ai bien apprécié les... La, la, le, ce que Da Silva nous a présenté sur euh, l'obésité. Deux milliards d'obèses, ça ne m'étonne pas. Et l'obésité commence déjà ici, dans cette salle. Pendant que nous allons euh, boire un petit café et boire, manger les petits croissants, les petits gâteaux sucrés, c'est le danger aujourd'hui le poison d'aujourd'hui, c'est le sucre. Voilà. Et je voudrais encore dire autre chose. Vous insistez, M. Da Silva, sur l'exploitation familiale. Eh bien, au Gabon, l'exploitation familiale est en danger à cause des éléphants. Des WWF éléphants. préconise la sauvegarde des éléphants. D'accord mais vous ne voyez pas toutes les larmes de toutes ces mamans qui, un matin, s'en vont dans leur plantation et qui les retrouvent dévastées par les éléphants. On ne fait rien pour protéger la nourriture des hommes. On veut sauvegarder la nourriture des animaux. Voilà. Merci, merci beaucoup. Donc, attention. <rire> voilà, nous avons attention au sucre alors. Et puis, euh, donc, cette euh, attention qui a tiré sur euh, une situation euh, telle qu'on ne l'imagine pas de loin. On voudrait tous se sauver, évidemment, les éléphants et les autres animaux. Mais, euh, alors, nous avons encore, le secrétaire général ici me dit que nous avons encore deux interventions possibles. Et puis, il va falloir passer à la deuxième partie. Je suis désolée. Donc, euh, le micro 2 qui n'a pas encore parlé. Je vous en prie. Thank you very much. My name is William Dauda, National Director, 
Caritas Sierra Leone. Um, I really want to thank the uh, Director General of FAO. The analysis about obesity caused by unprotected food, I actually uh, believe strongly in that, especially the types of food, I mean, that are produced and that are being sold in supermarket. Um, when he mentioned about protecting local farmers, I think also that is very um, necessary, but also um, giving the analysis in terms of what um, the local population actually will need in terms of food in Africa and what is being produced. I think strongly that we need to invest more in local farmers in Africa who normally are not engaged in industrial farming. They, they mostly they actually would FAO provide to local farmers in Africa to be able to produce enough food for the population. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Donc nous avons maintenant, euh, nous pouvons donner la parole à une autre intervenante. Je crois que c'est une. Buenos días, Janet Marquez de Caritas de Venezuela. Al, agradecemos las palabras del señor de la FAO. Y me gustaría preguntarle, eh, usted habló de dos causas. Eh, la causa de, que tenía que ver con el tema de, del hambre, que son los conflictos y los problemas mm, de causas naturales. Nosotros quisiéramos ver o vemos una tendencia más de gobiernos corruptos que hacen que un país pueda estar en hambre. Nosotros en el 2014 nos ganamos un premio por la FAO de tener alimentos para alimentar más o el doble de los ciudadanos de Venezuela. Y no han pasado cinco años y tenemos un país en hambre con una desnutrición aguda y crónica que pone en peligro a los niños de Venezuela. Entonces creemos que hay una tercera causa, gobiernos corruptos y criminales. Merci beaucoup. Donc je crois que nous n'avons plus nous n'avons plus de place pour d'autres pour d'autres intervenants, je crois. Non, vous me confirmez que nous n'avons plus de place pour d'autres intervenants. Donc nous allons directement passer à la deuxième partie de ce Ah, très bien, très bien. Excusez-moi. Excusez-moi, puisque monsieur Da Silva a été interpellé par certains d'entre vous, donc euh, il va répondre aux questions qui lui ont été posées. Pardonnez-moi. Merci beaucoup. Je veux parler euh, espagnol. Euh, quiero empezar pour répondre à la pregunta de Venezuela, eh, porque le thème de Venezuela a été utilisé de muchas manières, et une de las choses qui siempre se repite es comment est possible que la FA. Les cuento que en 2015, cuando estábamos por cumplir las metas del milenio, si se acuerdan, las metas del milenio era reducir a la mitad el número de hambrientos. En 2014, de acuerdo con los datos de la FAO, 72 países cumplieron esa meta, entre ellos Venezuela eh, y muchos otros. Y la situación cambiaron en muchos otros países y sobre todo en Venezuela. El tema como lo veo, ese año nuestra uh, evaluación de los datos en Venezuela son muy malos. Lo vamos a presentar ahora en julio y eh, estamos uh, en un número de hambretos creciente de manera asustadora. Eh, si hubiera más tiempo, les explicaría más en detalle. Pero nuestra evaluación es que en Venezuela hay un colapso económico, por varias razones, que empieza con la caída de los precios del petróleo en 2012 y 2013, eh, y eh, se agrava sobre todo con el bloqueo del último año, que no permite importar alimentos. Venezuela un país que importa... 95% de los alimentos. Eh, en un bloqueo eh, es desastroso. En la FAO 
para nosotros utilizar hambre como una arma de cualquier lado es inadmisible. Eh, el derecho a la alimentación es un derecho humano básico, es como el derecho a la vida. Así que no apoyamos ninguna forma de bloqueo, ninguna forma de manipulación de información. Y sobre todo no apoyamos tampoco gobiernos corruptos, dictatoriales, etc. Ahora, no se puede negar que hace cinco años los números en Venezuela le daban metas del milenio. Eh, nosotros creemos, monseñor eh, del Irak, firmemente que hay una relación entre hambre y paz. Tanto que reportamos semestralmente al Consejo de Seguridad los datos de hambre. Hambre es como una proxy de conflicto. Cuando intensifican los conflictos, intensifica el hambre. Pero también al revés. Cuando intensifica el hambre, aumentan los conflictos. Como ha pasado en muchos países árabes. La primavera árabe es un retrato de eso. Así que nosotros somos los primeros a estar promoviendo la paz como una condición sine qua non para erradicar el hambre. Eh, la pregunta de, sobre eh, forestas hecha por eh, la Mesa 2, creo. Eh, sí, creemos que el impacto mayor hoy día sobre el medio ambiente es la deforestación. Si podemos parar la deforestación, cambian los números radicalmente. Eh, incluso mucho se discute, por ejemplo, sobre el impacto de la ganadería. Una cosa es la ganadería de pastura, lo que llamamos la ganadería verde. Esa tiene un impacto similar a otros impact, impactos de otros productos, como la soya, la producción de caña de azúcar, y tiene que tumbar la floresta para expandir. Y eso pasa también con la producción de soya, con la producción de caña de azúcar, cualquier. Cuando se incluye derrubar la floresta para producir, ahí el impacto sobre el medio ambiente es mucho mayor. Sobre Gabón, eh, no sé decir mucho sobre los elefantes, pero eh, sé decir que eh, nos preocupa mucho el tema de la obesidad en Gabón. Gabón es uno de los países que más crece la obesidad. Ustedes no me van a creer si yo digo que de los 20 países que más crece la obesidad en el mundo, 10 están en África y uno de ellos es Gabón. Eh, increíble que sea así. África pronto será reconocida como el continente de la obesidad si no se hace algo y no del hambre. Y eso es la, el cambio que se está procesando. Eh, eh, señalo en Gabón el trabajo que estamos haciendo para proteger el pescado. Gabón es una área muy favorable a la pesca. Entonces, la protección de las aguas de Gabón contra barcos extranjeros que vienen a pescar, lo que llamamos el Estado Rector del Puerto, que es un acuerdo que prohíbe y da la autoridad nacional para arrestar los barcos de pesca sin licencia. Eh, eso es la actividad más importante de y FAO ahí en Gabón. Sobre qué estamos haciendo para Family Farm en África. Eh, yo diría muchas cosas, no me da tiempo de listar. Es nuestro principal programa de trabajo, es asistir las pequeños productores Family Farm en África. Lo que más nos preocupa en ese momento es, son las enfermedades, enfermedades animales y vegetales. Enfermedades animales como la peste de petit humina, por, por ejemplo, que dicima las ovejas, las cabras en África hoy, y sobre todo eso es el asset de los más pequeños, nos preocupa muchísimo. También lo que se llama Fall Army Worm, que es el gusano del maíz que está devastando la producción de maíz, que es un producto básico de alimentación de los más pobres en África. Eh, quiero terminar 
eh, agradeciendo esa oportunidad de poder hablar a ustedes. Es decir, que nos interesa mucho la FAO acercarnos al trabajo que ustedes hacen. Trabajamos de manera muy similar y con los mismos problemas. Así que una parcería sería muy bienvenida. Muchas gracias. Donc aux questions qui ont été posées par la salle. Je donne la parole maintenant à Babita Ali, qui elle aussi voudra réagir par rapport à, à ce qui a été dit. Une minute seulement. Nous, sommes, nous devons être très concis. Well, I'll not take much of time. It's just uh, uh, kind of considering all the situations and the alarming challenges that we have seen here today. I think uh, rather than just working with you know, trying to reduce the problem, we need to have a different approach to the problem, how we are trying to look at the problem. And I think Pope Francis's doctrine, which talks about the whole, uh, you know, the uh, one common family, as well as the globalization of indifference, I think that is something which we need to look at, because we as people here have only one thing to do is to kind of break this culture of indifference into culture of consciousness. And if that happens in the communities and with the government, we can bring that change and we can address much of the problems that are kind of persisting here. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup. Donc, euh, des idées se sont dégagées. Nous avons entendu euh, deux interventions qui nous ont alerté sur euh, plusieurs questions. Euh, J'ai remarqué que le, la question de l'obésité euh, avait eu un, un vaste écho, mais pas que celle-ci. Nous avons entendu aussi euh, le représentant irakien nous rappeler qu'il y a des guerres. Et, euh, et puis, bon, euh, surtout, euh, n'oublions pas qu'il ne peut pas y avoir de plan B, parce qu'il n'y a pas de planète B, nous a dit tout à l'heure euh, Monsieur Da Silva, et que nous sommes tous euh, sur le même bateau, et donc il faut agir ensemble, je crois, euh, Michel Roy, déjà. Donc, nous allons essayer d'aller un petit peu plus vite. Nous avons une deuxième partie qui nous attend, une deuxième session. Euh, nous avons parlé du monde, plus en général, nous allons aller davantage vers l'Église. Là aussi, euh, nous aurons euh, deux interventions très différentes entre elles. Alors, est-ce que je peux déjà euh, annoncer nos prochains intervenants euh, et, euh, en leur demandant de, de venir ici à la table Alors, justement, nous avons là aussi ce que nous avons avec euh, Péruvien, qui est très engagé euh, aux côtés des populations autochtones d'Afrique. Et nous aurons une humanitaire luthérienne qui nous arrive de Suède, et très exactement le cardinal Pedro Barreto, archevêque de Huancayo au Pérou, et Maria Imonen, qui est secrétaire générale du service mondial de la Fédération luthérienne mondiale, donc, vous avez euh, un petit mouvement derrière euh, mon dos à mes côtés, puisque les intervenants de la première session donc, euh, ont terminé leur présence ici. Nous passons à la deuxième. Le cardinal Pedro Barreto donc, est péruvien. Euh, il est, entre autres, vice-président du REPAM. Alors, je pense que la plupart d'entre vous savent de quoi il s'agit. C'est en fait un réseau panamazonien qui a été euh, créé il y a quelques années et à la création duquel le cardinal Barreto a beaucoup euh, travaillé. Euh, ce réseau donc, rassemble les pays qui sont concernés par les thématiques qui ont un lien donc, avec l'Amazonie. Nous savons tous que l'Amazonie est un des poumons de la planète et qu'il est menacé par toutes sortes d'exploitations de, de ressources minières et autres. Mais non seulement c'est l'environnement précieux qui est menacé, mais aussi... Euh, les populations et surtout les populations autochtones qui ont un style de vie que le cardinal Barreto a, a découvert et a beaucoup apprécié, donc euh, leur sobriété, euh, leur euh, manière de consommer peu, autrement, donc une vraie leçon de vie pour nous tous. Euh, le, vous ne serez pas étonné avec ce que je viens de vous dire, que euh, le cardinal Barreto participe à la préparation du synode sur l'Amazonie qui a été convoqué par le pape François et qui se déroulera à Rome en octobre prochain. Donc vous savez que ce synode va euh, euh, s'occuper de, de, de différentes questions qui interpellent l'Église euh, en Amazonie, dans ce territoire, et essayer d'aider l'Église à faire face, à aider les populations autochtones et à faire face à toutes les menaces qui pèsent sur les personnes et sur l'environnement. Donc nous sommes en plein... Dans la, dans la thématique euh, si chère au pape François, euh, à la fois la défense de 
défense des personnes, car on ne peut pas séparer les deux, c'est l'écologie intégrale, on ne peut pas séparer les personnes de l'environnement, d'autant que les personnes pauvres, surtout, sont les principales victimes des atteintes à l'environnement. Donc, je donne la parole tout de suite au cardinal Barreto. J'ai l'honneur de vous demander de parler au cardinal. Un saludo muy cordial a todos ustedes. Voy a tratar de ceñirme al tiempo que me ha sido asignado y yo quisiera que ya podamos comenzar con eh, unas imágenes que nos ayuden. Eh, una sola familia, una sola casa común. Hay un imperativo, no solamente eclesial, desde Cáritas, sino desde la humanidad, de que tenemos que unirnos. La unidad en la diversidad, como decía ayer el Papa Francisco. En segundo lugar, creo que es muy importante señalar que Dios nos regaló una tierra hermosa, bella. Y por otro lado también el interés de, uno, de un grupo de personas de utilizar un bien común para beneficio de unos pocos. Y todo esto eh, dentro de esta Asamblea General de Cari, trabajo y aún enfrentar juntos los desafíos presentes y futuros de la humanidad. Creo que aquí está eh, la esencia del problema de la persona y de la sociedad, la libertad, libertad para hacer el bien, libertad para hacer el mal. Dios nos hizo libres. Y por otro lado también, y esto lo ha dicho el Papa Francisco en la Laudato Si, eh, el dolor de la tierra y el dolor de los pobres no puede esperar más. Debemos actuar ya. Y por otro lado también, eh, ahora hay un consenso científico de que el mundo está enfermo, se está recalentando. Eh, esto no es eh, para asustarse, pero esta es la realidad. Eh, la Tierra está enferma. Ese niño como el representante de Oceanía indicó hace unos momentos. Y por otro lado también tenemos que pensar en que estamos en una situación de emergencia. Caritas debe responder a esta emergencia y a muchas otras emergencias. Esta emergencia, escuchar el clamor de la tierra, el clamor de los hombres el clamor de los hambrientos, 820 millones de hermanos. Y escuchar desde lo más profundo del corazón. No se trata de hacer una reflexión teórica porque no solucionamos nada, pero sí al escuchar nos remite a otro aspecto, yo diría, fundamental, que es este, esta constatación de una tierra desierta, una tierra que así Dios no la ha creado. Nosotros estamos llamados a reflexionar para cuidar nuestro mundo, para actuar con cariño, con amor, porque hay una urgencia, ya no es solamente una emergencia, una urgencia de discernir ese discernimiento y esta búsqueda de la voluntad de Dios según la Evangelii Gaudium y la Laudato Si. Por cierto, hoy día se cumple un, el cuarto aniversario de la publicación de la Laudato Si. 
Y por otro lado también esta emergencia, esta urgencia, nos exige una acción eclesial, una acción conjunta. No hay suplentes, todos somos titulares. Eh, seamos de donde seamos, de los cinco continentes, de todas las razas, de todas las culturas, de todas las religiones, la acción eclesial supone en primer lugar una curación, una curación de la tierra, curación de las personas, convertir a la iglesia a través de cáritas de cada país, de todo el mundo, de cada diócesis en un hospital de campaña, un hospital de emergencias dada la urgencia de discernir desde, como hemos indicado, desde el Evangelii Gaudium y también desde la Laudato Si. Esta acción eclesial de curación tenemos que aprender de los niños y niñas que son sensibles a esta problemática que sufre nuestro mundo y que el clima, que es un bien de todos y para todos, está afectándonos en todo lugar. Aquí el mensaje es de esperanza, de paz, una paz que es fruto de la justicia y justicia ambiental. Esa paz que el Papa Francisco al final de la Laudato Si nos anima a las pasiones que tenemos por la tierra, por los hombres, no nos quiten la alegría y la esperanza. Incluso llega a decir que mientras haya una persona buena en el mundo, hay esperanza. ¿Cuáles son las respuestas ante los desafíos de la Iglesia desde el Evangelii Gaudium? En primer lugar, recordar la frase de Paulo VI en el Evangelii Nunciandi, la dulce y confortadora alegría de evangelizar. La alegría del Evangelio, la gaudete exultate, que es la santidad, llamados a la santidad, a la alegría, pero del anuncio evangelizador a una conversión ecológica, misionera. Un segundo aspecto fundamental es, desde el Evangelio Gaudium, es la renovación sinodal, el sínodo, que es parte esencial de la misión evangelizadora de la Iglesia, es caminar juntos, es escuchar desde lo local, desde las comunidades, para poder discernir qué es lo que Dios quiere y qué es lo que a Dios le agrada que nosotros hagamos. Esta renovación sinodal se inscribe dentro de la reforma en una iglesia siempre en proceso de renovación. Nunca podemos detener el Concilio Vaticano II y que a través de, los, de las décadas y concretamente el Papa Francisco, quiere vivir la experiencia del Concilio Vaticano II. Una tercera eh, dimensión o propuesta del Evangelio Gaudium es la dimensión social de la evangelización. El mismo Papa habla que este documento no es parte del magisterio social, sin embargo, todo el capítulo tercero habla de la dimensión social de la evangelización. Por tanto, todo creyente, todo bautizado, tiene que vivir esta dimensión social, esta preocupación por el otro, preocupación por la tierra, por la creación de Dios. Caritas no es un añadido, al contrario, está en el corazón de la misión evangelizadora de la Iglesia y la propuesta es la ecología integral, cuidar la vida y la casa común. 
Y un cuarto y último aspecto del Evangelio Gaudium es la llamada a una santidad del amor evangélico en la mística de vivir juntos, de compartir juntos las alegrías y las tristezas, los gozos y las esperanzas, como decía la, la Gauda, eh, Gaudum et Spes número uno, propuestas ante los desafíos de la familia humana desde la laudato si. El mismo Papa dice que la laudato si es parte del magisterio social de la Iglesia. Recoge todo el proceso que se inició eh, desde la Rerum Novarum, pero concretamente sobre el cuidado de la casa común, cita a San Paulo VI en la Populorum Progresio, en que él ya alertaba hace 47 años o más, alertaba que el avance de la tecnología era tan rápida que podía irse contra la misma vida y dignidad de la persona humana. La ecología integral, eh, los efectos del cambio climático, para mí es muy importante también ver este aspecto fundamental de la violencia, de la violencia familiar y social. Dos sínodos sobre la familia, un sínodo sobre la juventud. ¿Por qué? Porque el mundo grita, la humanidad necesita paz. Y el Papa propone la cultura del encuentro, y de la integración por el diálogo. El diálogo es, desde diversas perspectivas, llegar a la verdad, y la verdad es Dios. Por otro lado, también tenemos que indicar que la movilidad humana es uno de los ejes fundamentales de la laudato si, socioambiental, y, y también política, eh, y la Iglesia debe acoger, y de hecho lo está haciendo, pero el problema es tan grande que a veces nos faltan manos, corazones, mentes y lugares para acoger a tantos. La pobreza y la cultura del descarte, nos habla el Papa, y la justicia como propuesta, no somos simplemente sociólogos, antropólogos o asistentes sociales que nos preocupamos, no. Lo hacemos desde el corazón de Dios porque Dios no nos descarta a nadie. Por último, la democracia participativa y desarrollo, al bien común, no al servicio del bien de un grupo. Y aquí estamos tocando un problema generalizado en el mundo. Y para eso se nos propone en la Laudato Si buscar un modelo de desarrollo humano integral cultivar y cuidar la casa común de todos, eh, del 20% de la Amazonía, que es eh, una región, un bioma, un pulmón, el 28% de la Laudato Si, la Amazonía, la cuenca fluvial del Congo y también eh, los acuíferos guaraníes, en diversas partes del mundo. La deforestación, el 20% está deforestado para la palma aceitera, para intereses económicos. Y esto nos dice que la tierra es, tiene una capacidad de resiliencia porque nos ofrece diversidad de frutos. El agua, que es símbolo de la vida, pero ¿de qué sirve el agua contaminada? Pero en esta inmensa eh, región amazónica, 
vuelvo a repetir, 7 millones y medio de kilómetros cuadrados, solamente 3 millones son indígenas amazónicos. Esos 3 millones de indígenas amazónicos, y ahí está también presente Caritas en, todo, en toda la Amazonía, eh, conforman, está conformado por 390 pueblos con sus culturas, con sus tradiciones. Eh, hay más de 240 lenguas. Es plurietnica, pluricultural. El trabajo previo del sínodo amazónico, eh, la Amazonía es un espejo de lo que pasa en la humanidad. Muchos se preguntan, ¿por qué un sínodo sobre una región? Vuelvo a repetir, es un pulmón por la Amazonía. La vegetación de la Amazonía como un bioma, por su rica biodiversidad, atrapa el dióxido de carbono y que purifica el aire. Entonces, yo creo que ahí es esto. La diversidad de, de, de etnias en la Amazonía, el contacto con el agua desde pequeños, eh, el agua es vida para ellos. Lil eh, ha escrito un libro, un diccionario sobre la cuestión ecológica desde la laudato si y nos dice eh, como propuesta la feliz sobriedad, feliz sobriedad, es la propuesta también del Papa Francisco, vivir sobriamente para que otros puedan simplemente vivir, decía Mahatma Gandhi. Pero también es una cultura que quiere aprender, dispuestos a aprender, ellos se definen, y yo lo he escuchado también en alguna asamblea territorial de preparación al sínodo, que eh, ellos se fijan, su identidad está más en el ser que en el tener. Esta es la mayor riqueza, la mayor sabiduría que nos ofrece. Aquí estamos en la Comisión de Interamericana de Derechos Humanos, donde se presentó la red eclesial Panamazón. Él, él preside esta, esta comisión, eh, que él debía estar aquí presente, él quería estar, pero lamentablemente no, no pudo, y por eso estoy aquí yo. Termino con la experiencia de un papa que por primera vez visita la Amazonía. Una Amazonía que es de muchos colores, Estuvo el 19 de enero del año pasado en, al sur del Perú, en Puerto Maldonado. Participaron en, eh, 1.500 indígenas amazónicos de Brasil, Bolivia, y el Papa fue a escucharlos. El Papa estaba feliz dentro de esta experiencia. El sínodo sobre la Amazonía tiene un nombre, Nuevos Caminos para la Iglesia, y para una ecología integral. Eh, que por eso estoy así a la usanza de los indígenas. Muchas gracias. Merci, merci beaucoup, monsieur le cardinal, por ce, ce témoignage, cette intervention euh, très intense. Donc, le cardinal qui participe, donc, vous l'aurez bien compris à la préparation du Synode sur l'Amazonie, vous nous avez dit que la solution est ecclésiale, que personne ne peut nous remplacer et que nous devons faire un discernement spirituel, discerner la volonté de Dieu. Donc, c'est vraiment un message très important que vous nous avez adressé. Donc, je vais donner la parole maintenant à notre deuxième intervenante en lui demandant humblement de me pardonner, car je vous ai dit par erreur qu'elle venait de Suède, mais elle vient de Finlande. En fait, Maria Imonen est directrice donc, du service mondial de la Fédération luthérienne mondiale. C'est la branche humanitaire hein, de la Fédération, le département d'entraide, comme on pourrait dire aussi, ou de développement. Alors, si je me suis trompée, c'est parce que Maria Imonen euh, n'est certainement 
euh, inconnu ici de cette Assemblée, puisqu'en octobre 2016, vous en, vous en souvenez peut-être, hein, Caritas Internationalis et le Service mondial de la Fédération ont signé une déclaration d'intention pour la promotion de la dignité humaine et de la justice sociale. Et bien, du voyage en Suède pour les 500 ans de la réforme luthérienne. Alors, la parole à Maria. Your eminences, de Genève, en fait. <laughs> Your eminences, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, sisters and brothers in Christ, good afternoon. And warm greetings from the Lutheran World Federation, a global communion of 148 member churches who share a common Lutheran heritage and are shaped by diverse contexts in which we experience and witness to God's liberating grace. I'm honored and delighted to be able to speak with you at this distinguished and important event of the Caritas family and share some reflections with you regarding our collaboration and joint commitment and service to the marginalized people in this world. I also bring you special greetings from World Service, which is the counterpart of Caritas Internationalis in the LWF, whose mission to work with those most in need is identical to yours. 2017 was an important year in the life of the Lutheran Communion, as it marked 500 years since the beginning of the Reformation. We are grateful to how the Catholic Church supported us to do this in an ecumenical spirit. In preceding years, Catholics and Lutherans jointly developed a landmark ecumenical docu document from conflict to communion. It laid the foundation of an ecumenical approach. Besides being the first joint document describing the historical events and the theological understanding of the Reformation, it presents five ecumenical imperatives for our churches as we move into the future. The document invites Catholics and Lutherans to think from the perspective of unity of the body of Christ and to seek to express it. The fifth imperative is acutely relevant to this assembly and I suspect also the reason why I have been invited to address you. And it reads as follows. of the church does not serve only the church, but also the world, that the world may believe. The fifth imperative, Catholics and Lutherans should witness together to the mercy of God in proclamation and service to the world. In the spring of 2016, the General Secretary of Caritas Internationalis and myself found ourselves festivities of the commemoration and joint worship service, which was held in Lund, Sweden, led by Pope Francis and the leadership of the LWF. It was followed by a large public event in Malmö. The idea behind the event was this. As we move from conflict to communion, so we need to express a move towards joint service in this world. At the center of the event, which brought, brought together over 10,000 people in a large stadium, was the work of Caritas Internationalis and LWF World Service. Work of service to the world, the poor, the marginalized, refugees, migrants, the abused, girls, boys, women, and men. During the event, Michelle and I signed a letter of intent committing to find ways to work together globally and locally in the visible consequence of our joint ecumenical theological endeavor. It shows that faith and life are inseparable. It witnesses to all to stand together for the sake of the neighbor, a call which we root in faith. God, who enters creation and becomes part of it in and through Jesus Christ, calls humankind to solidarity with the whole of creation. The Secretary General of the LWF, Martin Junger, 
frequently refers to a story from the New Testament, which illuminates this understanding. It is the story of Jesus's transfiguration on the mountain, which deeply illustrates the connection between justification and justice, called to go down to the plains and meet the disfigured faces of the wounded and broken in Matthew chapter 17. Having met and seen Christ, we are drawn into God's movement towards creation to witness to God's liberating and transforming power in our world. Our letter of intent embodies and confirms both this calling and our response. It represents a joint commitment that has served as an important anchor for our collaboration. It calls us to look forward into the future, to find the opportunities for collaboration, to join forces and to work together as we look forward to the challenges of the years ahead. And surely there are many challenges we share. The world we are living in and the changes taking place which affect those of us working in humanitarian assistance, development aid and advocacy are not at all positive, And many of them are very frightening. Internationals to work together to combat massive threats to our planet, the environment, our common humanity are increasingly ridiculed, questioned and marginalized. What used to be seen as a shared basis for our national order, the unquestioned value and worth of each human being, created and born equal, suddenly seems at risk again. Collaboration would seem to be all the more important in our world, where there are, and there are many areas in which joint action, collaboration, and learning from each other will really make a difference. During the last Caritas Assembly four years ago, I had the pleasure of joining you all for dinner as I did last night. And I joined a table which was taken by eight African cardinals and bishop and myself. It was my first visit to a Caritas assembly, and I was wondering how our evening would know at all. So when it turned out that no less than three of them had actually lived in a refugee camp run by LWF many years, some for over a decade, and that everyone around the table had had free previous contact or collaborated with LWF in their home countries, I somehow knew I was among friends, brothers and colleagues. Dear friends, we know each other in the humanitarian field. This is just another way to get to know each other better as Christians and as churches while living into the unity that God has already given us in Christ. Mutual service, rubbing our elbows together as we put our hands to work, is at the same time a deep ecumenical engagement which fosters mutual understanding and trust. It helps us to recognize the call into God's mission that we share. The first one I want to mention is in numbers of refugees and internally displaced populations. The capacity of the humanitarian response mechanisms to deal with these challenges is stretched to the extreme. Access to many affected populations is becoming more difficult. Humanitarian workers are becoming targets of military action and violations against hum international humanitarian law are becoming more and more commonplace. Humanitarian action has been the traditional area of collaboration between our organizations. And in recent years, we have been engaged in developing conversations with some Caritas members, but there is much room for improvement and concerted effort to seek each other out. Capacity building of church members and local structures is a specific area at the grassroots level which could be an opportunity for us to find sustainable mechanisms and high impact as we continue to work in other network globally. Secondly, our joint engagement in the SDG framework of leaving no one behind. The erosion of, ba of the basic understanding that everyone is equal is also challenging us as we work to alleviate poverty globally. Overall, disregard for human rights will result in people being left behind, if not being crushed altogether. As we work to achieve the SDGs, we make sure to link them to the human rights framework, which still forms 
multilateral instruments which have been constructed to protect and safeguard all human beings. A specific challenge to us, which affects half of the world's population, is the fact that in so many places, advancements in the realization of women's rights are being eroded and past achievements seem to be slipping back instead of moving forward. Misogynist, fearful voices are becoming louder, wanting to halt women and girls from participation and action in church, as churches too. In the Lutheran World Federation, the introduction of quota systems already in the 1980s, as well as con consistent communion-wide commitment to uphold the equal part participation and contributions of women and girls to our common work have given us encouraging results. Everyone has gained because the situation of men and women has improved. Year in which humanitarian organizations and the inappropriate conduct of their staff members in the field have been highlighted. Issues around safeguarding and protecting the population we are working to serve, but also our own staff from harassment, exploitation and abuse are rightly gaining more attention. For quite some time, the LWF has worked with a complaints handling mechanism, which reaches the populations of concern and is known to all staff worldwide. Recently, we have engaged in discussions with Caritas on how to share experiences, learn from each other, and continue to improve our systems, resources, and capacities in dealing decisively with this difficult area. And finally, I would like to raise the specific challenge of finding the practical ways of collaborating between our organizations on the ground where Catholics and Lutherans live in communities side by side and work in the same regions as humanitarians. I'd like to give an example from Nepal, where my colleague visited of our organizations, but with little contact to each other before the signing of the letter in Malamo. After that, however, our local leaders came together and started to discuss joint planning, monitoring, community discussions, training. They started with no budget, but similar programming in the same communities. They got to know each other, shared meals together, discussed joys, successes, challenges, and failures together. And during that visit, my colleague saw something very special. The water system, the water tank. I won't interpret this division of labor from a theological perspective. The important issue here is how we have come together for the sake of the people we serve. We found ways to look into the future together and found the disfigured face of Christ together. That is what we need to look for together. Our sometimes small resources put together can result in the miracle of feeding the thousands. Sisters and brothers, Paul wrote to Philemon in chapter 4, I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers. I pray that your partnership with us in the faith may be effective in deepening your understanding of every good thing we share for the sake of Christ. What an inappropriate word for us all. Thank you, Caritas Internationalis. Thank you, Cardinal Tagle, General Secretary Michel Roy, friends, colleagues, for what you do and who you are. God's blessings on your assembly and your work in the world. For the glory of God, for hope and a future. Thank you. Merci. Les élus terriens peuvent être des témoins ensemble face au monde et face aux problèmes parfois effrayants auxquels nous sommes tous confrontés. Donc, merci pour cette intervention très écuménique et très encourageante. Donc la parole est à vous, Donc c'est le même schéma que tout à l'heure, vous savez que vous avez quatre micros, nous vous invitons à, à vous exprimer, aussi bien si vous le souhaitez par rapport à ce que vous avez entendu, ou bien à évoquer des questions qui vous semblent importantes, euh, indépendamment des sujets qui ont été abordés. Donc, nous avons entendu 
des droits des femmes, encore euh, à l'instant avec Maria, nous avons entendu parler des violations euh, du droit international, de l'ignorance des droits humains, euh, et puis nous avons eu une belle euh, intervention sur le drame de l'Amazonie, des populations autochtones de l'Amazonie. Voilà, est-ce que quelqu'un souhaite prendre la parole Nous avons, euh, voilà, c'est le, le 3, hein vous êtes près du micro 3. Voilà, très bien, à vous la parole, merci. Merci. Oui. Soy José Cho García, secretario ejecutivo, director de Caritas del Ecuador. Monseñor Pedro, ¿nos podría hacer un regalo diciéndonos del documento de trabajo para el sínodo esas tres, cuatro, cinco como insistencias, como desafíos, como acentos que nos van a proponer trabajar en toda la Iglesia? Gracias. Merci. C'est donc une question qui s'adresse directement au cardinal Barreto. Euh, Est-ce que quelqu'un veut poser une autre question pour le cardinal ou pour, pour Maria Imonen Ou bien euh, évoquer un des sujets Oui Oui euh, Vous êtes tout proche du, du euh, micro numéro un votre, si. votre nom et votre fonction, merci. Je suis Gabriel Atti président de Caritas Mauritanie, et je voudrais intervenir au sujet de l'intervention de madame de l'Église luthérienne mondiale. Je vous ai bien écouté, effectivement, il y a des choses très importantes qui se sont faites entre nous au niveau le plus élevé, à Malmo, avec les accords qui ont été signés avec le pape. Avec Michel Roy, je crois que les choses fonctionnent bien et que les choses donc, avancent. Mais ce que je souhaiterais avec l'Église luthérienne mondiale, puisque nous partageons les mêmes valeurs, et surtout par rapport au monde, aux réalités actuelles où nous, nous sommes confrontés aux mêmes problèmes, des conflits violents, du terrorisme, etc., des catastrophes naturelles, la seule chose, c'est que c'est sur le terrain que ça doit se passer. La véritable coopération, collaboration, la Mauritanie opère dans un pays musulman. Vous arrivez dans ce pays-là, vous avez une organisation centralisée, ce qui n'est pas le, le, notre cas. Nous sommes une confédération, il n'y a pas de hiérarchie, nous n'avons pas les mêmes moyens, nous n'avons pas les mêmes ressources humaines. Donc, lorsque votre représentant arrive sur le terrain, je pense que la moindre des choses, c'est qu'il vienne rendre visite à l'évêque et discuter avec l'évêque des moyens de collaboration. Donc, je voudrais qu'on développe cela au niveau du terrain. C'est bien de, au niveau international. Vu, je, on vous a même entendu, d'ailleurs, au niveau de la commission représentative. Vous êtes venu nous présenter un peu comment fonctionne votre organisation. Mais ce que nous voulons, nous, c'est au niveau du terrain. C'est là où ça se passe, les choses. Donc, il faudrait qu'on accentue notre coopération fraternelle. Mais comme vous, vous avez des fonctionnaires qui arrivent, qui ont les moyens, qui ont des véhicules, qui sont logés, etc. Ce n'est pas notre cas. Nous, nous sommes des petites caritas fragiles, des petites caritas faibles, et nous voulons donc que vos représentants viennent voir l'évêque, discuter avec lui et qu'on ait des contacts ensemble pour qu'on puisse opérer ensemble. Parce que c'est nous qui sommes sur le terrain, qui connaissons la culture du pays, qui connaissons la politique du pays, l'économie du pays. Et vous, vous venez comme un éléphant dans un magasin de porcelaine. Donc... <rire> <rire> il faut qu'on discute sur le terrain, il faut qu'on accentue nos relations sur le terrain. Merci beaucoup, Merci beaucoup pour cette question à laquelle Maria Monen répondra. Je ne sais pas s'il y a d'autres questions. Oui, euh, par ici. Alors, si vous pouviez vous approcher du micro pour que l'assistante puisse vous... Ah, vous avez déjà un micro, très bien. Je, suis... je vous en prie, allez-y. Je suis déjà à côté Parce que je ne vous micro. voyais pas. Miguel Angelo Laverri, évêque de Pointe-Noire, au Congo, Brazzaville. Par rapport à l'intervention du cardinal Barreto, donc, euh, je voulais uniquement donner un témoignage. Je suis dans un diocèse où le saccage systématique de la forêt équatoriale se fait aux yeux et au sud de tout le monde, tous les jours. Je voudrais vous donner des chiffres uniquement d'une journée, d'un mois et d'une année. Dans la ville où je suis avec Pointe-Noire, chaque jour, 
Il y a l'entrée au port des grumiers qui transportent chaque camion 50 tonnes de bois et des bois qui ne repoussera plus jamais dans la forêt, puisque l'Okoumé est fini dans nos forêts équatoriales. Il n'y en a plus. Maintenant, c'est des bois précieux qu'on exploite. Ces arbres poussent tous les 200 ans. Il faut deux siècles pour qu'un de ces arbres atteigne la maturité. Il n'y en aura plus. Et par jour, rentre au port de Pointe Noire, contrôle fait par la commission diocésaine de justice et paix, 200 camions par jour de 50 tonnes. Ça vous fait 10 000 tonnes par jour. Ça vous fait aussi par mois 300 000 tonnes de bois brut. Et par année, ça fait 3 600 000 tonnes de bois brut qui est exporté systématiquement vers l'Indonésie, vers l'Asie et sans contrôle d'aucune sorte vers la Chine. Moi, je demanderai à l'Assemblée aussi qu'on puisse exercer une pression sur les agir de la Chine en Afrique. Plus, à cause des contrats avec la Chine, il n'y a pas moyen de dire un mot. Merci à tous. Merci à vous. Le saccage des forêts donc, et la présence de la Chine en Afrique, des sujets très brûlants. Nous avons euh, deux personnes qui souhaitent prendre la parole, au 4 et au 2. Euh, le 4, allez-y. Egidiu Kondak, président de la Caritas Roumanie en Europe. Euh, je voulais présenter une question à Monseigneur Barito, euh, le cardinal Barito. Et vous avez parlé de développement humain euh, après et selon les, les, les encycliques euh, de Pape, euh, Laudato aussi et Evangelii Gaudium. La collaboration, comment on peut favoriser et encourager la collaboration entre euh, les représentants de l'Église euh, dans les différentes nations et la société civile et plutôt euh, entre l'autorité des églises et l'autorité statale dans cette question, dans ce dialogue euh, de développement humain. Merci. Merci à vous. Je, je vais donner la, la, la parole au micro numéro un parce que je vous avais oublié tout à l'heure, vous étiez là avant, avant les autres. Allez-y. Ocean Region from Fiji, Carita is yet to be born, but I'm going to be born in a few hours' time. <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank Cardinal for talking about the Amazon because it's the, considered the lungs of the, uh, the planet. It deals with the carbon dioxide. We have a similar commitment to that in the ocean, in the, the ocean which covers I'm told about two thirds of the world, the planet that uh, also the ocean also deals with the carbon dioxide. It takes in the, the the carbon dioxide into the water, increases acidity in the water. Last week, uh, Anthony Guterres, Fiji, to speak on uh, climate change. Yeah, climate change. Uh, unfortunately. Uh, Guterres was given half of the story about the planet, and it's only about climate change, but does not, uh, uh, the, he was not given how the, the island nations were caring for the environment. Also notable in that conference and conversation in the Oceania region is the absence of faith leaders who deal with grassroots people. So. The, so uh, what I want to say here is, so far in the Oceania region, even though Fiji was uh, the chair of the uh, COP23, is the, the absence of the voice of the victims or the, the direct uh, victims which, which, who are islanders in the conversation about climate change. Uh, right now, the voice that represents the Oceania region are the voice of politicians, NGOs. Absent is the voice of the people's voice that the world needs to hear that are suffering from sea level rising. Sea level rising is not a fairy tale, 
its will. Right now, Kiribati Island has already bought a big piece of land uh, in Fiji to move to when it is said that in 50 years' time, half of that island will be under the sea. So my, my plea here is that, uh, that we need to, like they do in Latin America, is to empower island nations who are the direct victims to become, you know, their voice and their own agent of uh, liberation. Thank you. Merci. Donc les, in les insulaires principales victimes veulent se faire entendre au micro 2. Je vous en prie, tout. Um, my name is Win Tunji, national director of Kaitas Myanmar for Asia region. When the speakers say about four, fresh water, a blood of the earth. In the Asia region, there is a Himalaya plate plateau, which is the base of the 19 big rivers, and also providing fresh water to 1.3 billion people in Asia region. My question to both speakers is, if there is an Amazon signal which try to save the trees in Amazon, how about the Himalayan Senor, which will save the water which has been feeding? Merci beaucoup. Donc, une proposition d'un un autre synode sur les océans. Très bien. Euh, nous avons encore le temps, je crois, de donner la parole au micro numéro... Euh, vous êtes le 3, là. Il y a quelqu'un au 3 qui attend depuis longtemps, qui patiente, excusez-moi. Allez-y. 3. Hola, buenos días. Soy Eva Cruz, Caritas Española. Quisiera, no tanto formular una pregunta en relación a las palabras que nos dio el Cardenal Barreto, sino más bien una, una reflexión y una animación. La reflexión es que, si bien es cierto que los desafíos medioambientales son enormes, también son urgentes y es necesario como habilidad para con los otros. El medio ambiente afecta, lo ha dicho Monseñor, sobre todo a los más pobres y a los más vulnerables. Y a veces pensamos que las soluciones tienen que venir únicamente desde los territorios y desde las personas que, que sufren los efectos de los desafíos o de la crisis medioambiental. Nosotros, como personas que vivimos también en otros espacios mucho más industrializados, tenemos una responsabilidad según nuestros hábitos de consumo para poder mitigar también los efectos y la crisis medioambiental sobre, eh, luego que tiene esas repercusiones sobre, sobre los más pobres y vulnerables. Por eso esa es la reflexión, somos responsables también, corresponsables para con nuestros hermanos, para con nuestro planeta, para con los distintos biomas de la naturaleza. Y como iglesia creo que estamos llamados a movilizar redes, no solamente en aquellos lugares, en la Amazonía o en la cuenca del Congo, y en torno a nuestras comunidades cristianas tenemos que ser capaces de animar eh, esa corresponsabilidad e introducir dentro de comunidades cristianas el reto y el desafío que supone el cuidado de la casa común, la protección y la corresponsabilidad para los, con los más pobres. Merci beaucoup. Y nous avons une dernière question au micro 2. Tu. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ra Rachel Carnegie from the Anglican Alliance. Um, first of all, I want to thank um, Caritas Internationalis so much for the invitation for us as ecumenical and interfaith guests, along with others. This ecumenical collaboration is so crucial, and I also want to just commend Maria for the, um, the, the example you showed us of how we can live and work serving the poorest and the earth in the unity that we already have. I wanted to um, pick up on was actually from a quote that Cardinal Turkson gave us this morning from Clement of Rome when he talked about what we the gifts and assets that we have is seen as a gift from God to be used for the body of Christ and this really um, struck me in terms of not just the gifts we have in global organizations and structures but also the gift of the local church the local faith communities and how those can be part um, absolutely part of the hope 
in the world. Um, and I think that the, um, the situation that has been spelled out so compellingly today, um, the, the strength and, and urgency of, of the problems, the crisis, means that we can do no other than to work together. So just thank you for modeling that in your invitation to us and in our path going together forward. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Voilà, nous devons travailler ensemble côte à côte. Donc, c'était la dernière question. On va bientôt terminer euh, cette, cette matinée et nous allons faire vite parce qu'il nous reste encore euh, une vidéo. Mais d'ici là, euh, donc, euh, nous avons le temps pour donner la parole au cardinal Barreto qui a reçu beaucoup de questions. Vous n'avez pas beaucoup de temps pour répondre. Et à Maria Imonen, donc, euh, monsieur le cardinal, si vous voulez bien euh, répondre aux questions qui vous ont été posées. Sí, voy a hacerlo. Son muchas preguntas, me alegra mucho. Eh, ¿Por qué un sínodo amazónico? Primero porque es un bioma, un pulmón de la humanidad, según lo que dice el Papa Francisco. Eh, es un bioma donde viven las personas y está eh, amenazado. Y al estar amenazado, Lógicamente, el Papa ha querido comenzar por una región, que es la Amazonía. Pero no olvidemos que estas reflexiones desde el sínodo especial sobre la Amazonía superan el ámbito estrictamente eclesial amazónico, porque se enfocan a la Iglesia Universal, y también al futuro de todo el planeta. El tema es nuevos caminos para la Iglesia. No dice la Iglesia en la Amazonía. Eh, dice también es para una ecología integral. Nosotros, desde la Amazonía, queremos reflexionar desde esa región pero también no perder de vista toda la problemática que han hablado eh, ahora muchos hermanos y hermanas en Oceanía. La red eclesial panamazónica ya tiene, de alguna manera, una, una red de redes. Es decir, eh, en África ya está la REVAC, en Mesoamérica está la Remán, en Asia Pacífico dentro de poco va a ser eh, creada la APEN. En Oceanía no, no conozco, pero debe haber allí hay un problema porque el cambio climático nos afecta a todos. Eh, yo comprendo y entiendo la pregunta, ¿por qué la Amazonía? ¿Por qué no hacerlo también en África? ¿Por qué no hacerlo en el Himalaya? ¿Por qué no hacerlo? Pero es que el Papa ha decidido comenzar por una región, pero teniendo, y vuelvo a repetir, las referencias de lo que eh, se está viviendo en el mundo. Otro aspecto que creo que es muy importante, eh, el Papa en julio del 2013 en Brasil, dirigiéndose a los obispos de Brasil, les dijo textualmente, la evangelización en la Amazonía es un banco de prueba y un examen decisivo para toda la iglesia, no solamente para la iglesia amazónica. Y por último quisiera eh, agradecer mucho el testimonio de nuestra hermana luterana y también anglicana, el diálogo interreligioso es fundamental. El ecumenismo, la palabra ecumenismo, viene de la palabra oikos, casa, y mene, oiko, mene es la unidad en la casa. Cuando hablamos del universo, es universo, un solo camino. Entonces, creo que estamos tomando conciencia que cada uno no va a resolver sus propios problemas, sino que juntos lo podemos hacer. Y el diálogo inter cómo podemos pedir a los políticos, etc. Por último, eh, afirmar una cuestión de fe. Dios 
creador del cielo y de la tierra, creador de la persona humana. No estamos defendiendo una ideología, estamos defendiendo y protegiendo el don de Dios que es la vida y la creación de Dios. Creo que esto es importante y yo, yo para terminar, decir, eh, Antonio Guterres, y me alegra que haya hablado y también haya hecho referencia eh, la isla, el, el obispo de la isla de Fiji, eh, Antonio Gutiérrez en el 24 de septiembre del año pasado, si no me equivoco, en septiembre, dijo a los jefes de Estado, el cambio climático va a unas velocidades vertiginosas y las respuestas de mitigación van muy lentas. Tenemos, dijo, dos años para cambiar de rumbo. Por el tiempo de dar la palabra a María Imonen, que ha sido también interpelada directamente por algunos de ustedes. Donc à vous, Maria. Thank you very much, and thank you for the question from the bishop from Mauritania, where LWF has already worked for over 50 years. Um, just to say that it's very clear that our um, structures in the LWF and within the Catholic Church are very different. Um, the letter of intent was signed between my part of the LWF, which is an operational um, arm of the LWF, but we also have 148 member churches that live in the countries all over the world and who are also counterparts to the Catholic Church. I think the letter of intent and its signing was a broader sign that there are theological, there are no more theological um, differences and our imperative is to act together and to find those solutions among churches, among bishops, among clergy, among lay people among professional humanitarians on how to work together for the glory of God and for the service of his people. And I think that's what we aim to do um, together. Thank you very much. Maria Imonen, qui nous vient de Finlande, ou plus exactement de Genève, finlandaise qui vient de Genève. Alors, euh, on aurait pu évidemment tirer euh, les, les idées maîtresses du débat de ce matin, mais comme je vous le disais, le temps presse. Donc, en ce qui me concerne, je vais prendre congé de vous en vous souhaitant bon travail à tous, mais la matinée n'est pas terminée, ne bougez pas, vous allez bientôt aller déjeuner, mais la matinée n'est pas terminée, donc la parole arrive. Merci, nous remercions les intervenantes et intervenants pour euh, cette intervention très riche qui nous ouvre euh, plusieurs voies de réflexion et nous pousse à agir et agir même rapidement. Nous remercions aussi Romilda pour avoir accepté de modérer cette euh, séance. Et euh, j'invite euh, Yevgeny Afnevski, euh, qui, est le qui est un réalisateur de film, euh, pour prendre la parole. Euh, Yevgeny est... Euh, il a été nommé pour l'Oscar et plusieurs Emmy Awards et il va nous présenter le film qu'on va voir dans quelques secondes, un film qui est réalisé par lui-même. Merci. Yeah. I, first of all, thank you for having me here. It's great to be here. And I'm, I'm a filmmaker, not speechmaker, so I will do it short. First of all, it's a great inspiration to be here among this beautiful humanitarian family. And as the symbol of something, I brought with me something for your amazing leadership, for somebody who contributed to the movie about Holy Father, something that basically shows a beautiful globe. And I would love to present this to his eminence, Cardinal Tagle, this little globe that I brought with me as a reflection of his actions that are impacting this little globe that we need to take care of. Your eminence. Uh, and now I will just a couple of words why I, the guy that was born in Russia, all of a sudden finding myself here doing a movie about Holy Father. I did a movie about Ukrainian revolution, which I witnessed and documented. And it's resolved in a movie called Winter on Fire that these days inspires Venezuela. And I saw today representatives of Venezuela. I saw a movie being, show, being screened in a 
basically in the streets of Venezuela, in the streets of Nicaragua these days I saw it. And then I learned that I can take what I see through the lens of my camera and bring to the bigger world, inspire people. I went and I learned about refugees. In 2015, when I released Winter on Fire, I was already filming stories about refugees and I reconstructed everything that's happened in Syria that basically ended as the cries from Syria, a big movie where I took from the grounds of the revolution that happened in 2011 in Syria and brought to our days, to the catastrophe that we are facing these days and you guys taking care of. And then going into this darkest side of humanity in Syria, for me, it was a really journey into the darkest side. I experienced this, I've been there. I realized that I need to, something that can inspire people, something positive, something inspirational, something human. We're missing humanity. And uh, that's what brought me to Holy Father. So what you're going to be seeing right now, it's a small clip from the movie that will be released end of this year by one of the Hollywood studios. And this is a clip that related to us, to American nation, what we're suffering, what we are witnessing these days. Please. Father says walls are inhuman. I think that uh, what he's arguing is that anything that disrupts our ability to see our own humanity in the other is a wall to human communication, to human dialogue, to human understanding. No podemos negar la crisis humanitaria que en los últimos años ha significado la migración de miles de migrantes de Centroamérica y otros países. Son hermanos y hermanas que salen expulsados por la pobreza y la violencia por el narcotráfico y el crimen organizado. Frente a tantos vacíos legales, se tiende una red que atrapa y destruye siempre a los más pobres. I was in the cells of the detention facility with children all around me. Crying with their faces full of tears. And I'm there crying with them. It was so amazing to feel that presence of each other, just embracing each other. And that woundedness as these children needed their mother and them telling me, por favor, sácame de aquí. You know, please get me out of here. Tears of the child asking for help. They say, thank you, sister, for helping us see that they're human beings. That awakens and makes us realize that we must be there for each other. That they're kids, they're children, and that they need us to be there for them and to help them. Forcefully separating children from their families is a savage act. It's an act of barbarism. We know, for example, that there are brain repercussions to the forceful separation of children. Why is this continuing? Sabemos que el padre de la mentira, el demonio, siempre prefiere un pueblo dividido y peleado es el maestro de la división y le tiene miedo a un pueblo que aprende a trabajar juntos on the eve of your historic trip to the United States and to Cuba we have gathered people in three U.S. cities Chicago, Los Angeles and McAllen, Texas cities that I know you wanted to visit but will not be able to so right here, right now a virtual papal audience. Ahora quisiera decir una palabra. Había allí una hermana, una religiosa, 
La quiero ver. Hermana Norma. Yo quiero agradecer en su persona a todas las religiosas de los Estados Unidos el trabajo que las religiosas han hecho y hacen en los Estados Unidos es grandioso. La felicito. It was amazing for me to be singled out and to be recognized for what we all were doing. To be a symbol of, of a presence of caring for humanity, to defend life, to say that this is what we must do, that this is the right thing to do, and the, how our role can make a difference in our world, in our church, in society. Le digo una cosa más. Queda feo que lo diga un papa, no sé. Las quiero mucho. <laughs> Thank you. Today, the Holy Father says walls are inhuman. I think that. After this uh, lovely video, I hesitate to ask your attention for some very mundane topics, uh, but they are important for our meeting. General Assembly, as you have already experienced, uh, our program is very full. It's even quite difficult to keep in the timing that was foreseen. And there is also much more. There are booths, and these booths are places of encounter. You're all kindly invited to go there. It's not just to get a leaflet or something. You can meet people there, talk about a region, a topic that you're interested in. And there are also sessions that you can book on several topics. In the booths, in the booths there is also one is for internal communications and our intranet system, extranet system, I think I should say, yes, extranet, Baobab, um, in which all of you, all, all the member organizations have a little site. Could we please ask you, in the course of these four days, to visit that booth and have a look at what we have on your member organization, so that we are sure that it's up to date and correct. In the same booth, you can also inform yourself about the mapping system, that the REPCO has decided to have, a mapping system in which we can share information about what we do, what our programs are, and we can find other member organizations uh, that we could work with together. And so you can inform yourself there. You can also learn what you as a member organization can do to help us all even better together. Then on Sunday, as you know, there is a concert and a, and a performance by uh, migrants in Rome, migrant communities in Rome. Uh, you could uh, register at registration by, by ticking a box. Uh, and those who did not do that yet, I would invite to please go to our reception desk in the lobby and um, say that you are coming. You're, you're very welcome to come there. Then we talked already about the voting. I understand that all the voting cards have been distributed. The first session after the lunch will also be the first session with a number of votes. And as Michelle already said in the beginning, we are going to use an electronic system. Um, maybe a few minutes before, we will put an extra table on that side where the devices are going to be handed out. The, you bring your card, you give your card to the person at, the, at that counter, and in return, you will get the device that you can use for voting. We will have two sessions in the afternoon now, the first and the second, without a break in between. So after the second session, uh, you are invited to bring the device back and you get your voting card back in return. Is that clear? But this is very important that this goes well. So bring your voting card, get your device, and that one will be used for the voting in the first and second statutory session. 
And then I would like to remind you once more to switch off your headset so that we can save the, uh, one other reminder, but I can't read it at the moment. Yes, for all the facilitators and champions to stay here for a short uh, instruction session. I will read the names out very fast, so please pay attention that your name is, when your name is mentioned, please stay here for a few minutes. Karam Abi Yazbek, Luis Carlos Aguilar, Samuel Zan Agologo, Maria Alverti, Francis Atul Sarker, Davide Bernocchi, Frank Bomers, Kathy Brown, Jerry Burns, Sean Callahan, Matthew Carter, Christina Dos Anjos, Patrick Dubuquois, Alistair Dutton, Patricia Del Felicite, Lorenzo Figueroa, Josetko Garcia, Zar Gomez, Santos Gotine, Noreen Gumbo, Hector Fabio Enao, Julianne Hickey, John Girawat, Albert Mashika, Moira Monacelli, Alain Mukuri, Jean Bosco Nintunze, Maria Neumann, Natalia Pairo, Jennifer Poidatz, Kim Ratana, Patricio Sarlat, Christoph Schweifer, we're almost there, Alphonse Seck, Marta Skretteberg, Hannes Stegemann, Walter Liemann, Bernard Thibault, Dominique Verhoeven, Andrei Vaskovic, Richard Vintunci, Gabriel Jan, Belinda Mumtsu, Josef Osei Bonzi, and finally, Joao Pereira. Thank you for your patience and